earlier this past week, uh, my family and I went for a walk. We have a, a walking path behind our house, and my girls love to ride their scooter, so they're riding their scooter up in front of us, and my oldest, Lily, had stopped to come back, and, and now she was kind of just going slowly in front of Ann and me, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, in the middle of the sidewalk, Lily breaks, and Ann was right behind her, and her toenail went, Ksh. yep. And uh, if you are a little squeamish, sorry, but it ripped off part of her toenail. And, and it was so painful. And uh, she couldn't put a Band-Aid on it because it was too sensitive. She couldn't put a sock on because it was too sensitive. Uh, she had to sleep with her foot out of the covers because it was that sensitive. And I remember going to bed that night, and we both kind of jokingly said, uh, it's going to be better tomorrow. It's got to be better tomorrow. We woke up the next morning and Anne had a splitting headache. And despite a cup of coffee, despite water, despite medication, she had it all day. And then she was on the phone and she was walking around outside mindlessly talking on the phone and she stubbed the pinky toe on the other foot on the corner of the house. And it was so bad that we're pretty sure it's broke. Her whole foot is black and blue now. Ah. Sometimes it doesn't get better, does it? You want to think life, it's got to get better. And then it just kind of gets worse. <laughs> I know that is, I mean it hurts, but on the grand scheme of things, she's going to be okay. But isn't that how life is sometimes? We're going through something and, and we think it's got to get better. You're going through cancer and you think it's going to get better. You're going through marriage issues. It's going to get better. You're dealing with tough things at work. It's got to get better. You're still hurting from the economy and you're thinking, it's got to get better, doesn't it? We're on the brink of a, an, an election. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, it's got to get better. It's got to get better, doesn't it? The sad reality is that sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there isn't healing from the cancer. Sometimes there isn't marriage reconciliation. Sometimes countries don't get better and they continue in the downward spiral. Sometimes life has a way of, of getting worse. And it's what causes us so much anxiety, so much fear, and worry because we just want things to be better we just want life to be good we want that hope the good news for you and me is that that's exactly what God's word tells you today it's going to get better so hold on why is it going to get better and how is it going to get better so we get to look at it as we look at Isaiah 25 because if anyone needed hope that things were going to get better it was the Israelites living in Jerusalem at 700 B.C. Uh, at 700 B.C., what did the, the Israelites in Jerusalem face? Political unrest. They used to be the number one ruling power, and now the Assyrians to the north were, and the Assyrians were ruthless people. They tortured people for fun. And they made torturing a game. And they were so powerful that it didn't matter if you even allied yourself with another country, they could come down and take you over. And it's exactly what happened to the kingdom of Israel to the north. Judah was a kingdom with Jerusalem in the south. To the north was Israel and their capital city, Samaria. In 722 BC, Assyria came down and absolutely wiped them out. Wiped them out so bad that they had no idea where the people went because they all scattered, never to be seen again. In 700 BC, Sennacherib from Assyria came down and just to mess with Jerusalem, surrounded it in a siege and said, remember who's in control here. Don't think your God can save you. Don't think your king can save you. We have control and we will squeeze the life out of you. How do you think the people felt? Fearful? Filled with anxiety? Worried? Absolutely. Then you get into the walls of Jerusalem, and what did you see? 
religious decline. Idolatry was all over the place for God's people. These people are supposed to be God's people. And they were worshiping idols. The poor were not taken care of. The vulnerable were being taken advantage of. There was no justice in the land. And so you you can't even look inward to feel safe about yourself because there's all this corruption going on. And for the Israelite who believed in God, they had to be thinking, will it get better? How will it get better? And Isaiah brings them a message of hope. In Isaiah chapter 25, from 13 through 23, God unleashes this message of judgment on all the surrounding countries. Egypt, I'm coming to to bring judgment. Assyria, I'm coming to destroy you. All the countries around Israel, God says, I'm coming. And then in 24 through 27, God says to Isaiah, pull back the curtain for the people. Pull back the curtain and let them see exactly what's coming in the end. And that's what Isaiah does for us. Isaiah chapter 25, we begin with verse 1. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things. Things planned long ago. Let's stop right there. God has a lot of characteristics, right? He's loving. He's merciful. He's grace-filled. He's all-present. He's eternal. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. All these characteristics describe God, and yet, what does Isaiah point to? His faithfulness. In perfect faithfulness. What would it like to be in a relationship with somebody who was perfectly faithful? I like to think I am, but let me tell you what I did this week. I went home for lunch and Ann was getting the trash ready to, to go out to the garbage can. I said, hey, don't worry about it. I'll take it out with me when I leave. Guess what I didn't do? Exactly what I said I would do, which is take the trash out. I left it exactly where it was, and the sad part was it was 15 minutes later. I didn't mean it. I just forgot. <laughs> Perfectly faithful. God never promises something. Never says he's going to do something and then doesn't follow through. God doesn't promise you that he's going to always be with you and then decides to leave you. God doesn't promise that you will rise from the dead and then say, just kidding. God doesn't promise that he's faithful and just and will forgive you your sins when you confess your sins and then say, just kidding, this one was too much. You've gone beyond the number. God is faithful. He is perfectly faithful. Think of how that must have felt for the Israelites in Jerusalem. Sennacherib is out there. We are surrounded. Everything seems to be in chaos. There's immorality and corruption in the city. Your city, God. Where are you? Have you left us? God's perfectly faithful. He hasn't gone anywhere. And what's he faithful to? Things planned long ago. What are the things planned long ago? That God and humanity would live together forever. That in peace, perfect harmony, perfect peace, you and God would live forever with each other. Before the creation of the world, God knew you, Ephesians says. God knew you. He cared for you. He chose you. Before the creation of the world, God had a plan that Adam and Eve, even though they would be unfaithful to him, he would make a way for humanity to live with him forever. And that was through Jesus Christ, his son. And throughout all of history, what did God do? He was perfectly faithful to an unfaithful people. It's what the Old Testament's all about. It is how God is faithful to the Israelites despite their faithlessness. He remains faithful and sends his one and only son into the world to bring peace between him and an unfaithful group of people. And that's such good news for you and me. Because though we wander, though we go our own way, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. 
God is faithful to the promise to forgive you through Jesus Christ. And because he's faithful, that promise is true no matter what your life brings. No matter how far you've gone and and when you come back, God remains faithful and just and will forgive us and has forgiven us and will continue to tell you, I forgive you. He will continue to tell you that you have peace with him because he's faithful. And he's working all things to bring you to him where you will live with him forever. And in perfect faithfulness, what does God promise? He says, let me pull back the curtain and show you exactly what's going to happen. Let's look at two through five. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. What does God say he's going to do? He's going to come and destroy the stronghold, the city, the fortified city of the foreigners who are raging against God's people. He's going to come and destroy them. Judgment is coming, and God will come to defend his people. Think of what this must have done for the the Israelites who are watching Sennacherib, who know the strong city. No one can defeat Assyria, but God can, and God would. We look around the world today, and it seems like evil is winning. It seems like those who, who, who are, are attacking a Christianity and ta- attacking his church seem to be winning all the time. And it seems like evil is growing throughout the world. And God says, the day's coming. The day's coming when they will honor me, when they will revere me. Either they will come to faith in me and be praising honor, or they will bend the knee in defeat because I am God and there's only one. And I will come to defend my people. And God says, on that day, who is he for his people? A refuge. A refuge for the poor. A refuge for the needy in their distress. A shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall. And like the heat of the desert. God says, for you. He is your refuge. Do you know what a refuge is? It's that place when everything is going wrong, when when the walls of the city, so to speak, would be taken down. You could run to the refuge and be safe. That nothing could, it, it was impenetrable. Nothing could get you. You were safe and secure and protected. And God says that's what he is for you. He is your refuge. The psalmist in Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Have you been to the mountains? Have you seen them? What are they a picture of? Stability. Immovability. No storm can blow over a mountain. No army can come and take out a mountain. They always stand. And so if you saw the mountains falling into the heart of the sea, how do you think you'd be feeling? Pretty terrified. And yet the psalmist says, we will not fear, even if the earth is falling apart. Why? Because God is our refuge and strength. He is our protector, and he will be and is your protector today And he is your refuge and strength on the day that judgment comes. You will be safe from all harm. Instead, you and I have something else to look forward to. Six through nine. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. A banquet of aged wine. The best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. 
the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. In the Old Testament, when, when the Israelites would come back from battle, uh, they would go and offer sacrifices to their God, a thank offering. And then what the, were they instructed to do? Cook the sacrifice and then eat it as a meal. And God said, I'm present with you as you eat this meal. God says he is coming to destroy all evil. And how are we going to celebrate? The same way the Old Testament people did when they came back from battle and were victorious with a celebratory feast. And God says, that's what you have to look forward to. The finest of meats, the most aged wine. For all you wine drinkers, it's going to be the best wine you've ever tasted. For all you meat lovers, it's going to be the best meat that you have ever had. As I said in the, the children's message, that's what I love about Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> you got those big family feasts where all your family and friends are gathered around and you have the best food, the best drinks, and for a moment, everything just stops. Everything outside the walls, the fears, the worries, the anxieties that are on our hearts are silenced for just a few minutes. That's what heaven's going to be like. And it's what you have to look forward to. But it's not just going to be 20 minutes of, of worries, fears, and anxieties gone. It's going to be in, in eternity. Why? Because God has swallowed up death forever. God has swallowed up death forever. He has consumed it. He has broken it down and digested it so it's never to be seen again. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, what did he do? He swallowed up death forever. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, it looked like another human being was consumed by death. Another human being had been taken by death. And yet what did Jesus do? He went into the belly of death and he came back out. And he said, you can't consume me because I devour you. And he rose from the dead, and now he's seated up in heaven, where death has been completely consumed. And one day, when you enter into heaven with him, when you enter that feast, it will never touch you again, because death has been swallowed up in victory. It will never, you will never have the shroud, the veil that, over, uh, that goes over your face in mourning ever again. God will say, let me lift that. You have nothing to mourn about anymore because death has been swallowed up. And then the tender-hearted God will wipe away every tear from your eye. All the hurts you have, he'll wipe those tears away. All the longings you've had, he'll wipe them away. All the fears that cause you, you to cry at night, God says, let me wipe them away. And then he does something so wonderful. He removes our disgrace. What is it that causes us shame and embarrassment and, and the feeling of disgrace? It's really sin. Either sin that I've committed or sin that's been committed against me. God says those memories that you live with, the embarrassment, the shame that, that, that makes you feel so icky about yourself because you can't believe you did that or said that, God says, I'll remove it forever. You'll never have that memory again. For the sins that have been committed against you, that make you feel vulnerable, that make you feel less than, that you're embarrassed about, that I can't believe this happened to me and I let it happen to me and I don't want anyone to know, God says, I'll remove it forever. Your disgrace will be gone for good. This is what heaven is like, and this is what you have to look forward to. 
And this is what your loved ones who have died in Jesus are already experiencing as they sit at the feast of the Lamb, enjoying eternal life, dining on life because our Savior swallowed death forever. So what? We just have to wait till then. Is this message uh, a message of hope, but it's kind of like, well, we got to endure all this hardship right now, and sorry, but hey, there's something good coming. Yes and no. Yes, the life gets ultimately better when we enter heaven, but what has God done for you right now? He's done a couple things. He's given you the gospel message. He's let you know that through Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. That at, at, at your baptism, Galatians says that you were clothed with Christ. He's covered your shame. He gives you the Lord's Supper, communion, where Jesus says, take and eat, take and drink. This is my body, this is my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. I will not drink it with you again until I enter my Father's kingdom. It's a foretaste of the heavenly banquet that is coming. We not only remember what Jesus did, we look forward to the banquet that is ours, the feast. And then you know what he gives you? A community. Verse 9. In that day, we will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. I'm reading a book right now. It's called The Great Dechurching. From the late 90s until today, do you know how many Christians have left the Christian church? 40 million. 40 million Christians in the last 25 years have left the church. What does that mean? It means that they were attending once a month, at least once a month, and now they attend once a year. Is it any wonder that in the last 25 years, anxiety and worry and fear has shot up through the roof? Because if you're not in church, if you're not in the Word, what, are you, your, what is your soul feasting on? The worries and the fears and the anxieties that come from feasting on media, from feasting on what's on the other side of the wall, so to speak, feasting on the threats of those who uh, are threatening Christendom, those who are threatening your life, the cancer Everything that is threatening your life, your soul consumes and is consuming regularly. But what aren't you consuming? The words of the living God, the bread of life, that Jesus Christ says, I am the resurrection, I am the life, and this is what's coming for you, the feast of eternal life. This is why we gather on Sunday morning, because we get to point each other's eyes to the hope that is ours. We get together and we get to encourage one another That yes, there's threats out there, but our God is our refuge and strength. We get to encourage each other. Yes, I've sinned and I'm embarrassed. We get to encourage each other. Your sins are forgiven. You're at peace with God. We get to encourage each other as we get to say with one another, this is our God. We get to gather in groups during the week in our connect groups. Where what do we do there? We say, this is our God. We trusted in him. And he did not put us to shame. And so let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation because this is our God. And because we have this God, life only gets better. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, you are our God uh, who is in control of everything. And that's such good news for us because uh, there's so many things on the other side of the wall, so to speak. The Israelites knew that. They saw what was on the other side of the wall and it was terrifying. Uh, There are so many things on the other side of our our walls as well that terrify us, that cause us to fear and be filled with anxiety. There's so many what-ifs of the world and yet there's one uh, fact that is always true. We have eternal life to look forward to. We have that eternal banquet that is yours and that is ours because of Jesus Christ. Death has been swallowed up. Our disgrace has been removed. And you will wipe away every tear from our eye. What hope that fills us with. We ask you to help us to continue to grow in this message every day. uh, Because it's only this message that brings us hope in a hopeless world. All the solutions of, of mankind are temporary. 
They come and go, but our God and the resurrection is for eternity, and we look forward to that day. Help us to feast on your word. Fill our souls, let us, our souls consume your word and the hope and comfort that comes from it. We ask all this in our Savior Jesus' name. Amen.